uh, easier to pronounce in English. I'm Greg, uh, I'm the co-founder of SHAPE, and I'm also uh, an alumni of this school, so it's good to be back here in ESA. Um, so, um, I want to talk to you about uh, something different, like starting your own venture after uh, your MBA is not something very common. Um, but I really got inspired with, with one problem, and I want to tell you a little bit of the backstory about that, and how it all started, and, and how today I'm, I'm showing for impact in terms of water. So what we do, basically, we mainly work on saving water. And how does it, this all start? So a few years back, uh, I was in Barcelona, I was doing my MBA, just like you, and I had a little child. Uh, yeah, this... this uh, Amideo, he's my son, he's four years old now, and um, not only he gave me the, this, this motivation of uh, preparing the world for future generations, but also he basically was the initiator of the idea. Because in his kindergarten at that time, uh, at some point there was a health hazard. All the children were getting sick at the same time. And we were wondering as parents what's happening. And eventually what we discovered is that there was, um, there was a leak of water going underneath the basement of the kindergarten, uh, causing development. Basically, was getting. What? What? You have forever. So paying for this water over We did some field studies. We noticed that, that old buildings, new buildings, all of them, because it's only something on, on goes and water scarcity, water stress. So it, it, it's an important matter like uh current demand. So so prices so people see the water water bill go like an example Cost of water, from my perspective, at least. Just a trickle. It's your year be better. Like over seven. Look at them. So then you look into this problem and try to dig down and to understand. And what is that? But just in homes, you have 15% of the distributed water that is lost. This water has been treated, it has been distributed. Lots of energy has been spent to get this water to your home. And that water is lost. And tiny percent of these leaks are actually also another problem, causing water damages in homes that are paid by home insurances. Home insurances 30% of their operational costs are just to cover water leaks. This was 12 billion euros spent every year thing to scale. And that's where I come back to my first graph. You remember, you have like insurance are spending also lots of money. But actually, it happened that almost every building is insured. So now what I'm doing is I'm selling this solution to insurance companies that are embedding this in an insurance policy and saying, they want, as a, it's a very traditional business insurance. Talking to them with environment is like, oh. but when you show them, okay, you, there is a return for you. And actually, what's the return for them? They can basically save on claims between 35 and 50% of the claims on water damage. There's also a value, 20% 
savings on their bills. And for their environment, it is clear, right? So all in all, we're creating a new ecosystem. New ecosystem, small startup, but we already have traction in different countries. We are already selling our solution in, in Germany, in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in France. So the scale is there, and now we're growing. So it's a first step. Today, we save 200 million of liters of water. That's not much, but it's kind of a lot of Olympic pools still. But by 2022, we want to save 100 billion of liters of water every year. And so that's the, the beginning of an adventure. It's been already two years uh, since, since I graduated, and it's moving on. And I think what I want here is basically inspire you and show you that there is also other ways to, to have impact. And um, that's it, if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Greg, and congratulations for the successful startup. Uh, we'd like to know um, if you have plans to expand your operations and your business into developing countries as well. Of course. So our, our mission is, is to work on water and, and to, to basically save water where the need is higher. So today we're working in Europe because that's the closed market, it's easy. All buildings are insured also, so it's, it's easier to get, to get there. But we are also looking into other countries where water stress is a big question. Um, today we're in talks, it's, it's the beginning. We're only a team of 10 people, ten people so uh, we can't do everything. But we're today already in Morocco, uh, looking forward to go in South Africa, Australia, these kind of countries where water is a, is a big deal. So yes, of course, um, I think in the next, I would say, five years, we certainly be there. Fantastic. Uh, I wonder, in your development of the business, what sort of ecosystems or accelerators, communities, have you been able to leverage for a purpose-driven business? I think the, the most important is, uh, when you start a business, is to be close to your own network. So I'm from Belgium, so starting in Belgium was very useful for me because I had my personal network first. We were partnering with, a, uh, with an accelerator who is basically expert in electronics. This gave us a very good sort of brand or to, to, to speak with these big corporates because big corporates, they don't go with a startup just like that. They need to have something solid behind. So we had that big corporate, a leader, a European leader in nanotechnology who was supporting us, basically to also help us to talk with these big corporates. So I would say there are different elements. Um, and today still, I think the ESA network is very strong. That's certainly one of the, the, the strengths I'm pulling on uh, to my, to my fellow, fellow students. Yeah. But something, yeah, something I want to say is yeah, the buildings of ESA are not yet uh, covered. <laughs> So, <laughs> that would be a good thing. <laughs> Thank you so much, for Greg, and we have a gift for, me, for you as well. Thank you. And next yep. up, we would like to welcome another YESA alumni, Winnie Ye from the World Economic Forum, Thanks. who's a lead in platform acceleration. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here today. And I say this because five years ago, I was sitting right there by that aisle, three months away from graduation, with zero experience in sustainability, thinking, how am I ever going to work on all the exciting topics I've been hearing about in these two days of the Doing Good Doing Well conference? My name is Winnie Ye, and I now work at the World Economic Forum, building and supporting public-private partnerships that work on a variety of environmental topics, including climate change, oceans, forests, food systems, and circular economy. And today, I want to share with you my path in hopes that it can help those of you that are wondering the same questions I was five years ago. So there are two main takeaways I wanted to highlight today. One is 
it's important to put extra effort and put extra time. Then the second one is you need to define your positioning. So a little about my background. Before ESA, I was an engineer, so something completely different from what I do now. I was interested in the topics of environmental and sustainability, but I had no experience in it. And I did the same. I reached out, networking with other people, but it was difficult. I was turned down left and right because I didn't have any of the backgrounds they were looking for. Luckily, a good opportunity came up. So right after the ESA, I joined Deloitte Consulting. And Deloitte is a big firm that does projects in almost anything, including improving sustainability for companies. So I reached out to two very small sustainability teams in Deloitte. And I was told that about 80 other people are doing the same thing. So it's a very competitive market, who would have known. And I had nothing to differentiate myself by. So I did a lot of extra work. On top of long consulting hours, and I'm not joking here, I also put in time to do research. I helped research and wrote a paper on renewable energy, and then later on, another one on blockchain's use and traceability. I worked on lots of additional research, supporting research on water, food waste, and also carbon disclosure project. Eventually, after all of this, I was able to gain visibility with that small sustainability team. All of them knew my name by one point, and I was able to get on my first food waste project with them. It was a lot of fun. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of just offering your help. And on the right, you can see I found my badge from five years ago when I was working with a team at Doing Good in World Conference. I was the co-chair for the sponsorship committee. And I was working with company corporates that have interest to be potential sponsors of the Doing Good, Doing Well conference. Little did I know that this experience working with the sponsorship committee would later on be one of the stories I used in the interview for my current job. You see, when I was interviewing with the World Economic Forum, the one thing I really lacked resume, resume was experience on grant management or fundraising. And I was able to use my little bit of story with the Doing Good, Doing Well conference to show that I did indeed have, even though just a little bit, of donor engagement experience. So, offer your help, put in the extra time. And the next key to where I really found important for myself is you have to define your positioning. I used to think that to work in a career in impact, you had to either be in the sustainability team or the CSR department. But then I sat down and thought about it like a good MBA problem and decided to put on a two by two. You didn't think you would see a two by two today, did you? <laughs> um, so here you can see on the X axis is a function type. You have on the right, the sustainability function, kind of the obvious option everyone thinks about. On the left is all the other core business functions, you know, your marketing, operations, finance, et cetera. And on the y-axis, you have the company type. The top is the companies that are built with the core sustainability or social impact mission, like Shape, that we just heard about right now. And on the other end, you have the other companies that have an interest in really improving this area. So I thought long and hard and realized what I will be focusing on would not be the top right quadrant, even though it looks pretty cool, but that my sweet spot will actually be in where operation, strategy, and sustainability make a junction. I want it to be that COO that drives sustainability improvement projects from within the core operations for a company that wants to improve its sustainability. And I realized, and I really strongly believe, that for a company to make a change on its sustainability, it needs to come from its core operations. So in Deloitte, aside from networking with sustainability, doing all the food waste, et cetera, research, I also worked very hard to get into the supply chain and manufacturing operations service line. And working with that service line, I learned the end-to-end -end of a supply chain, how a CEO would think, how they make decisions, measure risk, et cetera. 
And this experience really helped me learn. I wanted to learn so much that I could become that really good ally for the sustainability team, be the operations partner that helped them lead or help them drive sustainability transformation projects from the core of the company, the operations part. And here I, I really encourage those of you that are interested in this to think not just about those obvious options, but also go through this exercise yourself and find what is your sweet spot? What is that unique offering that you can give that someone with a pure sustainability function background cannot? And I think as MBAs with a strong strategy or operations experience, we have a lot we can offer to companies once you look beyond the obvious and you have to sort of carve your own path because these roles may not exist today. Um, so my lots of takeaways, if you asked me five years ago what I wish someone had told me, I would think it's these five things. Um, first, it's focus the area, because sustainability, when you reach out to someone with the informational interview, it's such a broad area. When I get calls, I don't know how to help you. You need to pick an area of focus, whether it's renewable energy or water or anything else. It just helps to have something you're really excited about. And second, find your positioning. You know, what from your background, whether it's engineering or finance, what can you bring that someone else cannot, that someone with a pure environmental background cannot bring for that company? And then invest extra time, because if you don't have experience in the area, this is how you can gain that little bit of experience. All the little research I supported in the beginning, it doesn't go on my CV now because they're so small but they help you either gain visibility with someone or build up the experience so they eventually want to work with you on the topic you're really excited about. Then network passionately, because if you don't have background, all you have is you have to sound so excited, you have to convince them that you are more excited about this than anyone else that's calling them because there are 80 other people. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to add that timing is also key. So sometimes it may not work out. You may be reaching a company at the wrong time, or they don't have that role. Maybe they are looking for someone with 10 years of experience in life cycle assessment. And that's fine. Just move on, go to the next one. <laughs> Call the next person. So today, I hope that I can help those of you who are wondering the same thing I was five years ago, know that there is a path for MBA students going into sustainability, even if you don't have any background. You need to do some soul searching, think about what area of focus you have, what could be your strength. And I also want to talk to those of you who may not be thinking about this, that in your future finance or operations or marketing job, there is something you can do. You can be that really strong ally for the sustainability department. And no matter what role you have, you can make a positive impact. Thank you. Winnie, I think we have time for one question. Oh, if you don't yes. Mind. Forgot about that. I was so happy I finished. <laughs> <laughs> So you've made it through this awesome career path. You're now with the World Economic Forum. So how do you describe sort of your day-to-day -day currently? Mm -hmm. So day-to-day, -day, I now actually do quite a few different projects. So my core role is operations transformation. I drive operations transformation projects within our what we call the green team. It's a 90-something people team that works on different environmental topics. I support all of them and I help identify what are capabilities we need going to the future. What do we not have now? What processes, roles, tools, additional resource, knowledge, whatever. I identify those and build a strategy for the future. My other roles I do, I have two pet projects I'm working on now. Um, one is on seafood traceability, sustainable sourcing for tuna and other seafood. Um, and another one is on a sustainable sourcing for um, electronics, metal, and such materials. So day to day, it really varies. Every week I'm doing something very different, and I think that's the exciting part of my role now. Thank you so much, Winnie. Thank Fantastic. you.
Thank you, Michelle. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, good evening. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to represent the forum together with Winnie here at the f uh, tonight. Uh, I hope next year, today, actually at the forum we are currently four YES alumni. Next year I hope we will many more. So you are invited, you know where to reach out to. Um, so I'd like to leave you tonight with uh, this evening with three as we have learned, I hope you have also learned this in our MBA, right? <laughs> Uh, the first one is that stakeholder capitalism is taking hold around the world. Okay? The second one is that corporate governance is the base of it. It's like it's the way that we align the management, board of directors, and investors, and the owners. And the third, and actually I think we have, I will leave five messages. The third one is that we are at the start of a decade of delivery. The fourth is that we are in the start of a decade of delivery. And the fifth, at the start of a decade of delivery. We have 10 years to deliver on the SDGs, and that requires very structured, disciplined work in the next few years. And we will talk more about that. Well, the forum is a neutral platform, it's a mode stakeholder platform, where we bring together government, private sector, uh, civil society, academic, to the academic sector, to work on the, what are the main challenges of our society, of our economy, and uh, shape the future together. For business leaders, it's the place where they shape their strategy of their respective industries, and they transform their companies for the future. What was very special in this meeting in Davos that we had now in last January, and was, I was glad to hear that it was mentioned here a couple of times, is that we brought the voice of the new generation, the next generation of leaders. And that is tremendously important and gives us very much optimism in the current context that we're living. Because this next generation is tremendously more conscious socially, environmentally, and ethically. You have all the tools to address these challenges that we are discussing. And what is more important, they are much more conscious than the predecessors in that process. Well, we talk about stakeholder capitalism, and this became actually the, the de facto theme of Davos. It was officially stakeholders for sustainable and cohesive world, addressing sustainability and all the, the disease, the, the challenges that we have on our societal level about, the, about polarization, about conflicts, and but, uh, but in reality, the day-to-day -day discussions that we would have between what really stuck with the people was about stakeholder capitalism. And that relates to what I mentioned about the decade of delivery. It's like because we, are at a mo we have to de develop, we have to build an economic system in these next years that can heal our wounded society, that can heal this, this planet that is diseased. And the private sector has an incredible responsibility in this process. Look, the, the companies cannot solve all the problems that we have in the world, that's clear. But if you look at all the structural problems that we have, everything that is truly complex, we cannot solve without a deep engagement and commitment and capacity of mobilization, innovation that we have in the private sector. And uh, going beyond that, with collaboration between public and private sector. And for that, we need to build trust between a multitude of stakeholders. Since the, I, I think today, the, uh, the Raymond was mentioning the, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, that this year was very much focused on the climate week. The, the, uh, Antonio Guterres, the, the Secretary General, uh, convened really not only 150 heads of states, but more than 2,000 business leaders, to focus on the, the, the very pressing challenge on climate change. Since then, hundreds of companies have signed up to the objectives of the Paris Agreement uh, on science-based targets for that process. But it's, it's too slow and too few. It's like we still have a very strong, very, very steep process ahead of us. 
But it's very positive that many companies, and especially companies like depicting here, the previous one was MasterCard, the, the here is about technology, Microsoft, is that these structural companies, structural or systemic companies, companies that have a systemic impact, that are committed to it. Because they're not only transforming their own companies, they are enabling their value chains, they're enabling all their clients, the whole economy to transform, and that is tremendously important. In Davos, we, together with this conference, we launched several initiatives. I'd like to highlight two of them. One is, and the link into the technology, it's about the, it's the reskilling revolution. It's like because SDGs is not only about environment. There is a very strong social, many social elements there. And for that, we need to reskill, we need to upskill one billion people in the next decade. It's like th that's a major challenge that we cannot do without a huge mobilization of private sector together with government and the use of technology. The other one is about how do we leverage and capitalize, mobilize initiatives to reforest, to plant one trillion trees in these next 10 years. So, because in, together with the reduction of emissions, we talk for the 2050 net zero emissions. It's like, how do we work on, towards the net zero? And the trees will be, have a major role in that process. But then it's not only about CO2 emissions, it's about the biodiversity, it's about the water that we're talking. There are many other aspects that we address when we are thinking about planting one trillion trees in 10 years. And again, role of private sector is tremendously important here. I have someone in the audience here that will know very well these two professors, another professor here, uh, uh, Maria Ginette, that works with these two gentlemen uh, who were in Davos, uh, Professor Colin Meyer here on the left uh, and Paul Collier on the right, both from Oxford. Uh, they, uh, Colin Meyer wrote the book of Prosperity, Paul Collier, The Future of Capitalism. They illustrated this debate about the stakeholder capitalism. Look, they, <laughs> With a very a good doses of British humor, they were describing about the traditional vision that uh, in the past, the boss of a company would know what had to be done, and the evil employees would not follow the illuminated path. And that this conception of the world was based on, on the traditional view on the homo economicus that, as we have heard today, has been a present economic theory since Adam Smith of that time. Well, the, the humans, that, that works well, according to the speakers, that works well with uh, a system of sanctions and the rewards that has been created for rats in laboratories. But uh, human beings have been able to create a more sophisticated system. It's like, in, in nature, you only have one model of leadership, which is based on domination. We, people, have created another system based on respect. But that requires a leadership, it requires a type of leader that will establish the purpose of organization, that will be able to catalyze, to, to channel the creative force, the creative energy of the workers, of, of, of the whole value chain of those companies to solve problems of people and planet. And, and that purpose is not about uh, an aspirational, vague mission. No, it's based on corporate culture, processes, metrics, a whole system that will guide the day-to-day -day decisions of those companies and the strategic decisions of those companies. And here's where it steps in corporate governance. Corporate governance, and it's tremendously important in this process because it's where we align the management, the boards, and the investors. Management cannot transform their companies if they don't have the mandate to that, if they don't have the buying of the ones who are then hiring them, putting them in place, and uh, establishing what's the vision for the company for the long term. We also heard today about Larry Fink and uh, the letter that he wrote to shareholders now in January, establishing several commitments from BlackRock. But uh, this was not the first letter, actually, right? It's like he's it doing that for several years, and uh, especially the last three ones, uh, uh, has been going in the process of, in this direction, of, uh, that companies need to have a strategic framework that it's not only to deliver on their financial commitments, but also to deliver on how 
to define and to establish to, uh, how they impact the world. What is their footprint in society? How they are contributing to society? Why do they exist? Why they are there? And here I would like to mention two examples of conversations that I had very inspiring in Davos, not this year, but actually the year before, with the CEO of a large German conglomerate, not conglomerate, but a large company, a uh, steel retailer in the steel industry. And he was saying that, uh, well, his board challenged him. Why did he spend so much time with the forum? Why he's working with an organization like ours instead of focusing on the bottom line? So he, he had to justify to his board why he was working with us on systemic issues and how his company had a role to play in addressing the main challenges of society. There's another CEO. It was a coincidence the same day outside of another session was the CEO of a, a maritime company, a shipping company from Sweden. And he said, well, my board is pushing me that uh, it's not enough that I change my company. I need to change my industry. But if I, if I only change my company, I don't solve the problem, actually. It's like we need to work on a pretty competitive space. The shipping industry has a challenge. That doesn't solve that I only change my company. It's a bit what we heard before about the big corp, right? It's like if he's on the train going steps behind, that doesn't, that doesn't change the direction of the train. That's what his board is pushing there. And the link here to Hilary Fink is that uh, despite being criticized for uh, greenwashing, not doing enough, it's like an uh, inconsistency between actions and what they are truly doing, the signal that he's giving to thousands of companies that are invested, and then the peer pressure that he creates for the other asset managers, and you should hear the, those meetings of the CEOs of the asset management industry. It's like, the, it's, it's sometimes, it's interesting to see that they are all moving this direction, not all in the same speed, not all with the same vision, but it's clear that it's a movement that no single company can be outside of that, no single company with that systemic impact, right, and not these large players. And so when Larry Fink and these other major investors give those clear signals to the companies that they are voting on the shareholders' meetings, that they will not support, they will not vote in favor of directors of those companies that are not pushing those companies to take actions to establish sustainability uh, programs and their strategies, this is a very strong sign for those companies to take action. And uh, so uh, not only, it's like he also took uh, commitments in terms of uh, carbon uh, industry divestment, and there are some other specific areas. But at least for us, what's more systemic, it's what uh, they're doing the impact they're having in thousands of companies that they invest. And here, I want to link back to the beginning of this conversation. And it's about your role is in the process. Your role, your voice in this process. We heard in the first conversation with Randall in the morning about the different types of activists the employees and the management, the, the professionals. So you have a very important role in the companies that you'll be assuming leadership positions in the next few years. We are having, the next 10 years, a major transfer of economic power and political power to this next generation. And uh, you have the opportunity to transform not only the companies that you work on, but to transform and impact the value chains of those companies. More and more you need to integrate uh, these values and uh, uh, this process in the whole value chain. When we talk about, uh, the, there was one slide mentioned about the Davos Manifesto this year, in 2020. The, the forum was the first organization to defend, to, to talk about uh, the moat stakeholder concept in 1971, and from there evolved the shareholder uh, stakeholder capitalism. Um, and this Davos Manifest, we talk very much about the importance of the companies in integrating uh, sustainability, human rights, respect for the employees across their value chains. That's why the forum focuses on working with these major companies of the world that can have that systemic impact. So it's important that, uh, you, that we, we have business leaders that have the ambition to not only accumulate wealth, but have the ambition to transform the industry that they're leading, that they're operating in. So you have the opportunity 
after you graduate from here to work in companies and impact millions of people through the companies that you are. And we hope that you will be there day to day, day in out, uh, impacting, inspiring those people to do the right thing, the right way to achieve our agenda 2030. Thank you very much. Silvio, we have more than enough time for questions, so thank you very much for allowing us to, to ask you a few. Uh, I think the first question is regarding how leaders need to, to put us in this right direction and tying into us as many of us as students. So how do us as the younger generation change the mindset or help accelerate the mindset of the current business leaders? I think there are multiple ways. It's like uh, there's not a single answer to that. One is related to what Winnie was mentioned, right? It's like it's about showing your interest in it. It's like showing your that it, it's not only about volunteering, but showing what, what are the areas of the organizations that uh, you are most interested in that uh, you want to contribute. But then also raising the challenging questions that you have the possibility to do, and it's sometimes much more difficult for the previous generation. It's like, it's interesting in Davos, we have 3,000 participants, 130 countries, 2,000 business leaders, 1,000 of those are CEOs, 60 heads of states, all those numbers. But we bring 200 more or less young people that are not in, in those organizations, nor government. They are global shapers and global leaders that they are invited there. And it's amazing. If you look at our sessions in Davos, uh, in our website, most of those sessions, including the one that I showed uh, with those two professors, uh, the people who make the questions are, 90% of the questions are, are the young people. It's like the young leaders there. And they are making those challenging questions that get these established leaders a little bit out of their comfort zone. And I think that's very important. It's like it's about challenging us, challenge the establishment, challenge this... Uh, leaders who are there and are you doing things because they are used to do the typical answer no it's not possible it's like I think the role that you one of the roles that you have is about the challenging process the other is also about consistency of actions right it's like and I think that it's it's a little bit about the, the, about the conscious capitalism right it's like a, we also need to be consistent and consistent in the decisions that we make as leaders and then it's not only about the environment, because those ones sometimes are the easy ones, because we feel good about it, right? It's like we feel it's, I, I think what I experience that is much more challenging is sometimes when we need to take very challenging decisions that are regarding people. It's like regarding respect for people in our day to day. Um, and, and those out get us sometimes out of your, our comfort zone. And I think challenge ourselves is another it's another process in this growth journey. Thank you so much. Where in the opinion of you and the World Economic Forum do you think lies the biggest challenge, or sorry, the biggest opportunity to drive change? For example, is it forestry, pollution, agriculture, carbon emissions? Okay. Before, before that, I want to add so one, one thing to the previous one. In order to challenge there also, it's very important that you keep your credibility because sometimes it's like you need to also have empathy to put yourself on the shoes of the decision makers that uh, they also need to make trade-offs. As the CEO of a company, they have multiple stakeholders to address to, right, to deliver to. So sometimes I, in the previous, the previous presentation was very much about sharing value among the stakeholders. At the forum, we frame rather as creating value for. It's not about creating value and then sharing, but we create value for all stakeholders. And the CEO has to create value for all stakeholders. So it's important that when you challenge the management, that you also consider that it's not only one perspective that the CEO has to deliver to. Okay? Now getting to this one. I, I, I have a bias to think on the 17th SDG, which is building partnerships. It's like a, because 
because they are all important on the 16. If we can eliminate poverty, gender equality, it's like a life underwater, life on land, it's like a, which one's fast, right? It's a, which one's first? It's like all the SDGs are important. I think all, they all have, and then when you think where lies the biggest opportunities, it will be, well, it depends, opportunities to deliver on what value for what type of shareholders, right? It's like, I, I think we could argue that climate change is our, overarching, most pressing, most impactful challenge that we have as a society, but, uh, but it probably is not the only one. We have others, right? It's like especially in developing markets. It's like a very difficult choice for policymakers, for companies that also need to work on social equality, social inclusion in those, in those societies. But, um, but we all have the opportunity to work on partnerships, on building alliances. All these challenges are too complex for single companies, for single governments, for single NGOs to address and to be able to, to really have an effect. And sometimes we perceive there is a little bit of competition in that space. It's like, oh no, I'm doing, who is doing that? And uh, competition for attention, for funds. I think we need to have much more open platforms of innovation and collaboration to be able to achieve the SDGs. And I, I think there is our, also you coming as new generation of leaders, you have a wonderful and beautiful Beautiful opportunity there. A question that touches on maybe a more specific aspect of the World Economic Forum. How does the forum go about affecting and having an impact on an issue such as the Amazon rainforest deforestation? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, the forum has uh, a very large uh, coalition initiative called the Tropical Forest Alliance. It's not that the forum has. There is a very large initiative called Tropical Forest Alliance. The forum has the secretariat of that initiative. It is funded by uh, four or five governments, Netherlands, Norway, Canada, and I think UK, Germany. Um, and uh, so this... Uh, group of people are working on tropical forests, not only in Brazil, it's like, but also Indonesia, in Colombia, in Mexico, um, in Africa. And so they are working through partnerships, local impact, uh, uh, support, basically creating impact in the value chains of commodities that often would drive the deforestation. How can you work then with uh, Nestle, with uh, all companies that are buying those commodities, and the Cargill, Louis Dreyfus, that are buying those commodities, so that they can include in their policies that they would not acquire commodities coming from deforested land. Um, and also working with other teams of the forum about traceability blockchain initiatives that can ensure how do we support those companies that they are, can be secure, that they are buying commodities that did not come from uh, the forested areas. So this is a specific one. The for, if you go to our webpage, like, we have 900 initiatives of, that are on our webpage that are where, if you look at the webpage of the forum, there's a space called the strategic intelligence. If you go there, you s there's a, a free version that you can access, you see, the, more than 900 initiatives that we are contributing, that we are putting our platform for these initiatives to be successful. We get very much involved with 150 of them. We either will have the management or we'll have a, a secretariat, we'll have someone sitting on the board of that initiative. But the other 750 are really grassroots initiatives, or initiatives managed by or launched by third party organizations. And what we do is that we put this incredible capacity that we have to mobilize resources knowledge, frameworks, governments, to make those initiatives more successful. And uh, we truly invite everyone to check that out and uh, see what are the initiatives maybe that uh, you feel very closely related to, that are impacting maybe your city, your country, and you can contribute to that and engage. Maybe a final question. Our audience would like to know, do we need to sacrifice growth in order to pursue the sustainable development goals? Well, I, I think there's heated debate about that, so I, I don't think there's a single answer to that. Um, 
At the forum, we are not working on that premise. It's uh, because uh, if you think from a perspective of, I, I make a parallel there, maybe it's not exactly an answer, but when you think about companies that are criticized about looking for profit, or then if you think about governments that need to grow their economies. Well, if companies are not managed financially in a sound way, if they are not profitable, if they are not sustainable economically, they will not be part of the solutions, they will become part of the problem also, because they will be laying off people, they will not have research to do their initiatives, so companies to be able to be part of the solution, they need also to be, managed, be financially sustainable. The same goes for governments that need then to have their economy, their finance in a sustainable way. So if the governments don't have some economic growth or financial stability, it's like it's difficult for them to support the people, to support, to have funds for environmental protection. I think it's, we find it very difficult to get a, the, that equation right without economic growth. Now, not all type of growth has the same impact in, in society. I think what's important is that today we already consume all the reserves that the Earth can deliver in seven and, uh, months and uh, 28 days, if I'm not wrong. By the end of July, we already consumed all the reserves that the Earth can deliver in one year. So, and then the rest of the year, we are borrowing from the future, right? It's, like a, it's clear that the current model of growth is not sustainable. It's like a, we need to change our model of growth. And we need to measure growth in different ways also. It's like that is also very different. It's like the, but whether we, will, we need to reduce the size of the economy, uh, reduce the growth, decrease the economy, I believe in the, the form we, I think majority of opinions are that uh, uh, we will create more problems than solving them. Or other problems that are equally very acute and complicated for lives of people. If you think that we have to integrate one billion Africans, <laughs> it's like they don't have water, they don't have sanitation, they don't have... It's like a, sometimes these discussions for us sound... It's like a detoucher from the reality of billions of people who still don't have the basics for, for their needs for the families and children. I think it's easier to say that uh, reduce growth here, but uh, let's tell those people that are in very dear needs that we'll have no economic growth more, I find that a challenge. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks.